Then put your little hands in mine. There ain't no hill or mountain we can climb. I got you, babe. I got you. Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative, maybe because I feel closest to them, because my brain always plays memories on loop, hoping against all that is logical that if I can just somehow fix those moments, get them right, I would be free from them. Everything is a perpetual present and a perpetual past. The future is too scary to contemplate. Strap in, folks. This is going to be a weird one. I have ADHD. Or at least I think I have ADHD. I haven't actually been diagnosed by any kind of metric, which is an entirely separate issue. But we all know how frustrating systems are to deal with, especially for neurodivergent people. The thing is, I only decided that I had ADHD about two years ago. And in that two years, the fact that I have ADHD has become such a defining part of my identity that it shocks me to think of a time where I didn't think I had it. Where it was impossible because I'm not hyperactive and I can focus. I don't look like people with ADHD look. Of course, when I said people, I meant men, because that's what most of our categories are defined by and using, it's always men. So many of the things that I eventually realized were ADHD, I had put down to a combination of anxiety and intelligence. Most people, when diagnosing it, only take the hyperactivity and attention deficit into account and disregard the focus part. So because mine manifests much more on that side of things, it was never even floated when I was at school. We even did those early screening activities where we were individually taken out of class and told to read a story and then have to remember details when questioned about it afterwards. And I always passed those with flying colors. Got told I was better at them than the other students. This wasn't in spite of my disability, but because of it. I would sit and focus and recall with ease because that was what I was best at, but it completely ruled out any suggestion I might be neurodivergent before it ever reached my parents' ears. I'd be diagnosed twice more with different things and be well into adulthood before I ever noticed the things that added up to ADHD. Lacking intelligence is not a prerequisite to having ADHD, nor is having anxiety and anxious behaviors, nor is hyperactivity. It presents more in people with learning difficulties because the learning isn't set up to help them. I loved learning. It was my favorite thing to do. I have always wanted to consume as much information as possible at all times, so I was well behaved, restless leg syndrome notwithstanding. I also had a quick recall over short amounts of time, so I was the best kind of brain while at school for the kinds of examinations and testing that they do on you. I academically performed incredibly well at school, which made me seem more intelligent than other students, even when that wasn't necessarily true. Because I performed well in things like English, I was very well spoken which meant I sounded equally as smart as the people performing really well in physics and advanced maths, which I couldn't do. The few times I ever got in trouble were for things like reading during class. I genuinely got a detention because I refused to put a book down even though I had finished the work early and then got frustrated when my teacher wouldn't let me read the book during the detention. Or things like getting too heated in class debates, another thing that can be easily explained by ADHD. There's a reason why female ADHD is viewed so differently because with stereotypical male ADHD, you're bursting with energy the class clown, unable to sit still. We had a group of boys in year 10 and 11 who were let outside during maths classes for 10 to 20 minutes to run around because otherwise they were gonna disrupt the class. Bearing in mind that I had ADHD at the same time as those boys, but I had to stay inside and focus because when I wasn't focusing, I didn't let it affect the people around me. That's nothing to do with my mental illness or my disability. It's to do with how I was socialized as a girl which is all to do with how inconvenient I was allowed to be to the people around me. The amount that people care about my disability or my mental health is proportional to how much it affects my appearance in society. I didn't disrupt the class and I was a straight A student, so there's no way I could be experiencing anything similar to those boys who would flip tables and talk back to the teacher if they weren't allowed to play hooky on the rugby field during double periods. And even if that was my internal experience, how would they know? And would they care if I told them? Would it have mattered? Would I have been allowed outside too? Or would I have been scolded for trying to get out of class? I think we all know the answer to that. So since I discovered the label, it's become one of the tent poles of my entire identity. Obviously, because I finally have a label for the myriad of different things that seemed so disparate and made me such a confusing amalgamation of a person. I'm not just anxiety riddled anymore. I mean, I'm still that. But it's different. It's separate. It's a label that I can use, that I can lean on. I am a bi, ace, intelligent, vaguely woman-shaped being with ADHD. And then I started posting videos on the internet again. And suddenly, I started getting an influx of comments about autism. Now, 
I have never been the kind of person that rejects autistic people on the basis of autism, because I think rejecting anybody on the basis of their identity is fucking stupid, because I was raised by one good parent. This is the bare minimum, by the way, but what this means is that I have a lot of autistic friends. A lot. A lot. It's most of them. But I have always put this down to the Venn diagram of abused kids, neurodivergent resonance, and queer spaces, and how they intersect to be a much more accepting place for people who don't exactly fit in with quote unquote normal society. I was exposed to more neurodivergent and disabled people from a younger age and felt a kinship with them due to my own diagnosed and as yet undiagnosed issues, and this continued into adulthood. Especially later once I realized I had CPTSD and that has a lot of crossover, behavior wise, with autism. But people were telling me I was autistic in the comments of my videos. People who were autistic were commenting very nicely, saying things like, oh, I'm autistic and I don't want to diagnose you, but as somebody with autism, this experience you've described sounds very autistic of you. Every time I've brought up anything about masking, or anything about how I view the person I exist as in society, or society itself, it was always met with, well that's autism. And I kept getting very frustrated. Because masking isn't just an autistic trait, it's a neurodivergent trait. It's an abused trait. Sometimes it's even a neurotypical trait when it comes to, for example, working a customer service job. It's just a lot more prevalent in neurodivergent people across all aspects of our lives rather than just customer facing jobs. It came to me specifically out of abuse. Knowing how to mask was vital for survival, not just at home, but at school where I had to pretend every day that everything was fine. I don't feel comfortable making eye contact, but that's also an effect of growing up emotionally abused. Sometimes eye contact was demanded and sometimes if I did it, it was proof I was a liar and deserving of punishment. To this day, the more strong emotions I'm feeling, the less I'm able to look at people's faces, like a perception filter. Look at me, you can see me, yes? Yep. What about now? I know you're there, but I don't want to know. Um, I'm back again. Because I'm scared, I will see them turn on me. I can go non-verbal for long stretches of time, but these can be easily broken by my people-pleasing tendencies. And even when I've wanted to give people the silent treatment, I am simply unable to because I hate making anybody else feel uncomfortable. I'd always rather pretend to be fine so it only affects me. I have special interests and hyperfixations, but those are a combination of the ADHD and anxiety. I needed something to get me through the bad days in childhood, and ADHD makes latching onto things far too easy for me. I have keen pattern recognition skills for the same combination of reasons. To notice what I was doing that triggered being shouted at, and because ADHD makes me better at focusing on things. All the things that are most easy to label as autistic traits can be easily explained away by my upbringing and my ADHD. And sure, I hate unexpected textures, but that doesn't mean I'm autistic. But the thing is, why does that matter? I don't reject autism because I'm scared to be autistic, because I don't see autism as a bad thing. I reject it as a label because it doesn't fit. Internally. Externally. There are two different halves of the thing that come together to make up your identity, right? The internal and the external. The internal perception of yourself and the external perception of you, and those two things together make up the secret third thing that is your identity. Or, as CJ the X put it in their Stranger Things video, The, the identity, identity of you is a primary, isn't primary. It's something, something you, you deduce, deduce from, the, from experience. the experience. So if other people externally perceive me in the behaviours that I exhibit as autistic, but I, as an internal experience, do not label them as autistic, what's the truth? And why does it matter? Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative. I love labels. I love lists. I love categorizing things. I love color coding stuff. I love organizing my workspace and my notebooks, even though it never lasts beyond a few weeks. Okay, that's generous. A few days? I got into a debate with my friend Tom once about whether or not he has autism, which he does. Don't argue with me, babe. You know I'm right. And then a few hours later, at a gathering among friends, he pulled out an enormous Excel spreadsheet that he'd made about football players with loads of columns of variables. And did I mention he did this in a pub? And from across the table, I said, autism. And he argued that I have a Google Doc where I keep track of my K-dramas, so how is that different? And I said, that's ADHD. ADHD is lists, autism is Excel spreadsheets. Yes, we are super fun at parties, thank you for asking. But again, why does it matter? Tom might have autism, or he might not, but what would that label mean for him? Would it make him realize things about himself? Would it make his life easier? Would it make his passage through society better or worse? For his partner, it might make them feel better because they do have autism and it might be affirming to know that part of why they get along so well is because their brains vibrate at the same frequency. But again, do they need the label for that to be true? No, it's true already. 
Time loops are my favourite kinds of- My mother suggested I might be bipolar once, and it upset me. I understand in hindsight why she suggested it. I only ever tell my mother when things are getting really bad, because if I informed her constantly about every little stumble my mental health took, she'd never stop worrying about me 24-7. But if I didn't tell her anything, the same thing would happen. So I tell her when things get really bad, and otherwise, I try to be overly positive to overcompensate for those negative emotions. From her perspective, as somebody in a different country from me, this probably looks like mood swings, but it upset me because it made me feel unseen. Like all the time I had spent talking to her about my mental health was being waved aside in favor of an explanation that didn't fit my lived experience. It's not your constant trauma in the form of CPTSD or your depression and anxiety working together to make your life worse or the other abusive relationship you're still in. It's a different thing altogether. It felt invalidating. There's nothing more uncomfortable than being slapped with the wrong label, put in the wrong box. That's the reason why my URL is Tell Us The Introvert, because I spent so many years perfecting my mask that people think I'm an extrovert when they meet me. I can be very personable, I can carry a conversation, I'm good at meeting new people, I've emceed events before, but none of that changes my internal experience of those things. I am a deeply anxious, perpetually uncomfortable introvert who curses myself for every word that leaves my mouth, overthinks everything, and assumes everybody hates me. But will you pick that up if I'm talking to you? No. I'm very good at hiding it. I've had decades of practice. I remember an argument I had with my SOS teacher when I was 14 over the MBTI test because I said I used to be an extrovert when I was younger and he said it's impossible for me to have changed, I have to have always been one or the other. This felt wrong to me at the time but I didn't have the words to express it and he was so sure that he was right so I let it go. I never forgot it though because I did used to be an extrovert. I was an extremely outgoing kid. I thrived in the company of others. And then as the years went by, that version of myself withered to nothing, but I couldn't let other people see that. So externally, I mask enough to appear the same. I'm an INFJ, if you are curious, by the way. I know that if I don't say it, I'm gonna get some very stressed comments from people asking me to tell them. I got you. I was a pretty emo kid. I never did the emo look, not really, because I was too scared of getting in trouble, you know, abusive household. But internally, I definitely lived the life. I've been obsessed with Fall Out Boy and Panic and Mike M since I was a child, and it definitely got worse in my teenage years. I cried when Mike M broke up cried again when I saw them live. I jokingly label myself a career boo before anybody else can accuse me of being one because even though I know I'm not, it feels like I have to get ahead of it somehow to acknowledge that my interest in South Korean media and culture is more intense than most people's, but that I'm not actually fetishizing it. I tell people I'm bisexual. I also tell them I'm asexual. Both are true, although I mean biromantic, but I've been bisexual since I was 14, so it's a comfortable label for me even if I don't quite fit into all its parameters. And biromantic asexual is always a harder thing to explain to people. Bi is easiest to understand. I speak openly about being mentally ill. I speak openly about growing up in an emotionally abusive household. I call it daddy issues because that's what society likes to call it. I'm still looking for the name of the chronic illness I have. Latest guess is fibromyalgia, but to get diagnosed, I'd need a lot more money. So for right now, I'm just waiting and getting tireder. It might not even be the right thing, but it's the one that fits the best. So for now, it's the best I've got. I'm white. I'm Australian. I'm British. I'm a woman. I think I'm a woman. Time loops. I'm a nerd. I'm a geek. I'm a writer. I'm a singer. I'm a Tumblr user. I'm a YouTuber, apparently. I'm overweight, fat, curvy, however other people choose to define it. I'm a blue-haired feminist socialist. I'm a good singer and an okay driver and a terrible baker. I'm a pretty good cook, though. These are the labels that make up who I am, but they're not me. Plenty of people share these labels. Hell, somebody out there probably has exactly the same labels as me. Does that make them me? Their experiences, no matter how identical, do not make up their internal self. Nor are those labels encompassing enough to truly state their external experiences are the same. You are made up of the things you love and hate, the media you engage with, the skills you possess, and the interactions you have, but is any of that your identity or is it all just labels? Is your identity just a collection of overlapping labels? How many labels can one person collect before you're just pathologizing existence. Naming things can be helpful. It can make you feel seen and understood, but it can also be reductive and make you feel uncomfortable or like an outsider if you're given the wrong label or excluded from a group you're sure you should belong to. Sometimes you really don't belong to that group, but you've been told that you can't function in society unless you conform to that group. So everything starts to feel like a hurdle to overcome and the labels start to feel like bear traps or labyrinths you can't escape. Everything is a perpetual present and a perpetual past. The future is too scary to contemplate. When you grow up being emotionally abused, you very quickly realize that nobody wants to hear about it. A core memory for me is being in year nine with a girl I considered my best friend at the time, at the end of the year, in the afternoon, starting to tell her about something my dad had done to upset me. And she said, and I quote, can you stop telling me things about your life? It's really depressing. And I internalized the shit out of that, obviously. 
so I got funnier. I had to be fun in order to be heard, so everything became a joke or a story. Everything had to be well written in order to be digested. I mentioned this in a few of my poems. Making myself digestible because my fear response was never fight or flight. It was always freeze and fawn. Freeze. Shut myself down. Make myself smaller. Make myself hidden. I'm a blade of grass. I'm a strip of wallpaper. I'm a rock under your shoe. I am nothing. And fawn. You are better than me. You've always been better than me. You're the only person I live for. I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. This is all my fault. Look what I made you do. I didn't realize joking about my trauma was hurting me until I watched Nanette, and even then it didn't sink in for a few years. Hannah Gadsby was right when she said, And what I had done with that comedy show about coming out was I froze an incredibly formative experience at its trauma point, and I sealed it off into jokes. And that story became a routine, and through repetition, that joke version fused with my actual memory of what happened. But unfortunately, that joke version was not nearly sophisticated enough to help me undo the damage done to me in reality. Do you understand what self-deprecation means when it comes from somebody who already exists in the margins? It's not humility, it's humiliation. I put myself down in order to speak, in order to seek permission to speak. You learn from the part of the story you focus on. Of course she was. Masking is killing me, but I can't take the mask off because I've been wearing it so long that it's fused to my face and I don't know which parts of it are just me. Are you my mummy? I joke about the worst things my father ever did to my friends. I joke about having daddy issues to strangers on the internet. I downplay the severity of my trauma every single day, even to myself. And that has made the process of actually recovering from those things so much longer and more repetitive. Every time I tell a horrific story like it's an anecdote, I open old wounds or scrape at barely healed scar tissue, an exercise less like Sisyphus rolling a boulder up a mountain, and more like Prometheus having his liver pecked out only for it to grow back so it can happen again and again and again. Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative, maybe because I feel closest. We're so uniquely lonely neurodivergent people. Our brains feel like sore traps that only we can navigate and subjecting somebody else to that feels cruel, so we try not to. Lock away the parts of ourselves that we know aren't fit to be seen and perform a version of ourselves we think the world wants to see. Queer people too. Who's safe to talk to? Who is allowed to know what kind of person I could fall in love with? Constantly navigating society's expectations and parameters in order to exist without being spat on or subjugated. Of course, the Venn diagram of these two factions of society is often a circle. It is for me, obviously. There's a reason for that, of course. Not all neurodivergencies are born, a lot of them are created by circumstance, and being queer is exactly the kind of circumstance that can lead to you being treated in a way that causes any number of mental illnesses. Anxiety, depression, OCD, CPTSD. Even if being queer wasn't the reason you were treated that way, from everybody I've spoken to, it seems like they were always labeled different even before they realized it themselves. The same way allistic people are often uncomfortable around autistic people, not because they know the other person is autistic, but because they don't. Something about them just rubs them up the wrong way. I've spent my whole life making myself so palatable to others that it feels like nobody ever gets close to seeing the real me. I'm not convinced I know who they are at this point because as I've said before, when you've been doing the performance for most of your life, who are you to say when the performance ends? Does it ever end? Sometimes I feel like I'm performing to myself alone in my room. How can anybody ever know me the way I want them to if I've hidden myself so well even I can't find me? So I'm lonely and I'm touch starved, but I'm scared of being loved and of being touched. So I isolate myself to protect myself and end up more lonely and touched up. And by extension, trauma interrupting our life's narrative so intensely and trapping us at that point in the past. Hey, what are you doing here? I already spoke about you. The two most common reactions to trauma are you suppress it, block it, compartmentalize it, and then try to continue with your previous story while that thing kind of seeps in and kills you from the outside. Or you get trapped in that memory and you can't Imagine your future anymore. You're just sitting here with this thing. You're like, guess I'll die then. Oh, I get it. The trauma creates the loops. Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative, maybe because I feel closest to them, because my brain always plays memories on loop, hoping against all that is logical that if I can just somehow fix those moments, get them right, I would be free from them. I've always loved sci-fi and fantasy. Grew up on Harry Potter and Doctor Who and Narnia and Skullduggery Pleasant. Universes where the world isn't always as it seems and maybe salvation is in the back of a closet or through a train platform or driving a 1954 Bentley Arta Continental. I wasn't raised religious. 
I tried to be, on my own, but God never answered my prayers, so I started praying to the only thing that had never let me down. Every night, I strained my ears for the sounds of the TARDIS outside my window, hoping against hope that the Doctor had picked up my pleas with some temporal device and would whisk me away to have adventures across space and time. Doctor Who holds an extremely special and personal place in my heart, because without it, I wouldn't still be here today. It got me through so much, and it instilled in me a lifelong passion for humanity and culture and learning new things and hope. Well, I see every life is a, is a pile of good things and bad things. Good things don't always soften the bad things, but vice versa, the bad things don't necessarily spoil the good things or make them unimportant. I love time travel stories. I love being able to go back to historical periods and mess with things, or forward into potential futures, or sideways into timelines that shouldn't exist, and time loops are my favourite kinds of narrative. I'm writing a novel about time loops, because I like a narrative with good parameters, and nothing is as self-contained and yet constantly evolving as a time loop story. They're always stories about singular character growth, about a person who might start as an arsehole. You're Hicks, Rita. You sleep okay without me? You tossed and turned, didn't you? You're incredible. But through the hardship of the loops, <laughs> Sleep in. Your plan totally sucks. Grows into a better person. You were right. I was scared. But I'm not anymore. Or at least learns more about themselves. Life is like a box of timelines. Me. As I entered adulthood, I started to feel an emotion that almost every neurodivergent people I know, and every overwhelmed neurotypical person I know, has felt at some point or another. I have continued to feel it every single day since. The feeling that if only the world could just stop for an indeterminate amount of time, that might fix me. I don't mean COVID lockdowns, I mean a pause on the universe. If I didn't have to go to work and come home and maintain my social life and meet family and societal obligations and bend to the whims of Tories and capitalist society, if I could actually rest without feeling guilty or stressed, without having to adhere to somebody else's expectations of what I should be or a timeline for suffering for once in my life, it might set me straight. Like putting a dislocated shoulder back in alignment. So the first character I wrote about was August, who is so depressed she doesn't even notice when the loop starts. Honestly, her first thought upon realising she was stuck in a time loop was just utter, chest-caving relief. She didn't have to figure her life out. She didn't even have to get out of bed. For once in her life, she could finally just ride out the feelings she was experiencing without the pressure to hurry up and get over it, to fix herself enough to appear as a functional member of society, to bury the quiet agony she felt at the dusk of every day. So she didn't bother. August lets the loop take over because sometimes we should be allowed to, and I never shame her for that because it's exactly what I want too. Other characters deal with the loops differently, but August was the first person I wrote right after COVID when I had been isolated for two months in a tiny shoebox flat with barely any human contact in a way that almost felt like a time loop, but not quite. Because the pressure was still there, maybe worse than before to just get through it. The anxiety of what felt like the world ending was crushing, and rather than a loop, it felt like time just fell out of step with itself a little. Half a second out of beat with the rest of the world, enough to isolate a person, but not enough to feel like time travel. I wrote a poem about it, after I swore to my lecturer I'd never write anything about COVID because living through it was frustrating enough. It was the first poem I ever had published. Serves me right. It was called The End of the World, after the R.E.M. song. I was told it would start with an earthquake, birds and snakes and aeroplanes, and instead we've got closed doors and capitalist fury and Lenny Bruce would be ashamed. Politicians drop bombs on us in the form of, go back to work, it's not that bad. The economy takes precedence over humanity and people riot in the streets to fight something they don't understand. Parents are dying. Children are dying. And all we can do is stay inside, keep the locks turned, try not to lose your mind in solitary confinement. Tragedy shouldn't be at this volume. Too quiet, too loud, too much, too empty. Ghost towns are supposed to be for the dead and there are far too many living here. It's the end of the world as we know it, and I thought it would come with more fire. But it's statistics on a screen and numbers that lose meaning when economists ask how many is too many, as another hundred die. You can feel how alone I was. I'm still affected by that period of time now. How could I not be? I haven't recovered from it, not really, but time keeps marching on and capitalist society tells us the rest is a waste of time, so I keep pretending I'm fine with everybody else. Sometimes I think we're all just pretending to be people. Descartes says, I think therefore I am, but as CJ the X pointed out in their video, other philosophers have disagreed. That school of thought says a person is a person through other persons. Can both be equally true and equally false? You don't cease to be if you're marooned on an island, but you do cease to be perceived. And does that kill a version of you that only existed to be perceived? If a tree falls in a forest, I don't know what I'd use time travel for. In childhood, it was always an escape, exploration, diving into the unknown and the unknowable. As an adult, 
It all feels too inevitable. Whatever time I travel back to, it'll lead right back here. If I go forward, what kind of world will I see? Will I want to? I watched Aranok's video on queer relativity, and it made more sense to me than anything has in a long time. The poem, the soldiers, the book, and the video express the violence of time found within systems, but also the strange freedom within queer time. We leverage the interconnected temporality of past, present, and future because... I wonder sometimes if the reason queer people experience time differently is because we live with death so close that it changes our perspective and mind like Dr. Manhattan. Does Dr. Manhattan experience time differently because he learned the language of atoms? I wonder if I experience time differently because I learned the language of trauma and death. It's impossible to talk about queer time without understanding that the past bleeding into the present is, in part, a result of traumas, both personal and communal, and that the future weighs on us due to the potential for negative possible futures. The way you perceive time is different when you're queer and traumatized. Time is always happening at you. You don't have a choice, all you can do is perceive it, but in perceiving it, you create it, and that makes a whole host of new problems. Fun slips through your fingers like sand through an hourglass, and misery lasts forever. Time is devastatingly relative, but it's also eternal and happening all at once. People assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect, but actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. Yeah, I've seen this bit before. It's an Ouroboros. Ooh, yeah. Got it? It's an everything bagel. I got bored one day, and I put everything on a bagel. Everything. So time loops became the thing I hyper-focused on in adulthood, desperate to consume enough narratives where people fix themselves with time that I could do it myself. It's comforting. I mean, nature is just a series of loops, what's more natural than falling into one? Everything is a cycle or a spectrum, and sometimes the spectrum is actually a snake eating its own tail. History repeats itself. You make the same mistakes in relationships, abuse is a cycle, begetting the cycle of trauma, the sun rises every day, life is born from death is born from life, I wake up and another war has started, the world is on fire, the world is on fire, the world is on fire. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, but when have I ever claimed to be sane? Time loops. Samuel Beckett was an Irish writer and playwright. My deepest apologies, but to quote Wikipedia, his literary and theatrical work features bleak, impersonal, and tragicomic experiences of life, often coupled with black comedy and nonsense. His work became increasingly minimalist as his career progressed, involving more aesthetic and linguistic experimentation with techniques of stream of consciousness, repetition, and self-reference. He is considered one of the last modernist writers and one of the key figures in what Martin Eslin called the theater of the absurd. I studied Beckett, as every A-level drama student does, and hated his work in a good way. It made me frustrated and uncomfortable, and I have never felt my restless leg syndrome more keenly than when forced to sit through his plays. And that was almost entirely by design. A good comparison for the modern age would be playing pathologic. It takes so long to get anywhere. Even if you're not in immediate danger because things are going well, you're still giving up a lot of your time going places, and the clock is still ticking down. So you're always racing, and you're always racing slowly. But this is also the point of the game in Microcosm. It's not supposed to be fun on its own. Here's a head scratcher. Are games supposed to be fun? This boredom isn't a bug, it's a feature. It adds even further to this sense of disempowerment. It also has a profound emotional effect. As you get increasingly aware of your impending doom and how limited your abilities to get things done really are, even walking around becomes tense and stressful. You don't watch a Beckett play because you want to have a silly goofy time, you do it because you want to have an experience wholly unlike almost anything else. The one we studied for was Waiting for Godot, obviously. It follows Vladimir and Estragon, who meet near a tree and strike up a conversation, which eventually reveals that they are waiting there for a man named Godot. Over the course of the play, they meet some other people, converse, and are passed on the message that Godot cannot make it right now, but he will show up the next day. So the second act follows them going through very similar, read, almost identical motions, only for the same boy who passed on the original message to tell them he isn't coming, and actually he didn't speak to them the day before. The two men agree to leave, but as the curtain falls, they don't move from their places. We are happy, we are happy. What do we do now, now that we're happy? <laughs> It's a famous play for a reason, and there are numerous interpretations, religious, spiritual, political, societal, but it's not the play I want to talk about. Act Without Words 1 is a short, silent play written in 1956 and first performed at the Royal Court Theatre in London in 1957. I first watched it in a Year 12 drama class, sitting cross-legged on the floor and wanting desperately to get up and start pacing the entire time. A man appears to be flung into a desert. He hears a sound to the right and runs towards it off-screen, only to be thrown back into the centre. 
The same happens when he hears the sound from the left. He is clearly hot and thirsty and miserable and trapped by some unknowable, unseeable force. He looks for shade, using his shirt to cover his head, and behind him a tree descends from the sky with a whistle. He sits in the shade it provides. Then the sky delivers him a large pair of scissors. While he checks how sharp they are, the tree folds up, retracting its shade. He lifts the shirt back over his head in defeat, and behind him a glass-labeled water descends from the sky. He jumps, but it is ever so slightly out of reach, no matter how hard he tries. A crate descends from the sky. He climbs on top of it, but the glass has risen the exact height of the crate, so he climbs off it, dejected. Another, smaller crate is dropped from the heavens with that frustrating whistle sound, and he stacks them the wrong way round and falls before finally stacking them correctly, climbing on top, and then watches as the water ascends even higher into the sky. Truly subdued this time, he ignores the whistle and the arrival of another crate. Then, a rope drops from the sky. Hope. He climbs up it to reach the water. Just before he gets a hand on it, the rope lowers him back down to the sand. He takes the scissors up with him and, very dangerously, do not try this at home, cuts the rope off while he's hanging from it. He has rope now. He makes a new lasso thing and aims to throw it around the glass, but it disappears into the heavens. He's devastated. He realises he has a tree, a rope, and a crate, and decides to take his own way out rather than die of dehydration. But as he finishes getting it all set up, the tree retracts its branch. He tries to escape again, but is thrown back into the middle. He notices the scissors and contemplates using them. While he is considering it, the scissors, rope, and small crate are lifted back into the sky behind him. He is so utterly crushingly defeated that he collapses into the sand and even when the water is floated directly in front of his face doesn't dare to reach for it he's been burned too many times so he sits as it hovers there and then flies away behind him the tree spreads back out again he doesn't turn around to see the shade then the tree is taken away too the play ends with him sitting in the sand staring at his hands this is my favorite beckett play i hate watching it I hate how frustrating and futile it is. It is a uniquely aggravating experience. If you think that me describing it was irritating, try and sit through the full 14 minutes of that filmed version without wanting to tear all of your hair out. But it's my favorite because it's the one that never left my head. I still think about it sometimes. About the eternal torment of that man, about the carrots being dangled and retracted, about what it could mean, about the endlessness of it the loot. It appears to be a modern retelling of the Greek tale of Tantalus, who was punished by the gods for stealing ambrosia and nectar, made to stand in a pool of water beneath a fruit tree where the water would recede if he tried to drink it, and the fruit was always just out of reach. But we don't know this man before he enters the frame. We don't know if he did anything wrong. So all we can do is pity him. And even if he did do something bad, how bad would it have to be before he deserved punishment like this? The most popular interpretation is that the play is a parable of resignation, of learning the hard way that you cannot rely on anything. S. E. Gontarski argues that within this obvious traditional ending, Beckett works his consummate skill, for the real play begins with its terminus. The climactic ending of the mime may signify not a pathetic defeat, but a conscious rebellion, man's deliberate refusal to obey. Lucky has finally turned on Pozzo. Ironically then, the protagonist is most active when inert, and his life acquires meaning at its end. In this refusal, this cutting of the umbilical rope, a second birth occurs. The birth of man. However hollow the victory might be, it's still a victory. As long as he believes it is. As Beckett ruminates on in another work of his, a piece of monologue, birth, birth was, was the death, death of him. him. Again, words are few. Dying too. Birth was the death of him. The dead and gone, the dying and the going, from the word go. The word be gone, such as the light going now, beginning to go. Birth was the death of him. Man has given birth to himself, even though it appears it will mean the death of him, because what other choice does he have? Everything is a perpetual present and a perpetual past. The future. I don't know what my future looks like. I can barely see past my hand in front of my face. What does the future me look like? Like this, but older? Making the same mistakes, living the same memories in her head day after day until she's trapped in them, still berating herself because she should be over it by now. Is she... a she? Surprise, bitch. I bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. That's right, I tricked you into watching a trans essay. You've been here long enough now, pull up a few, settle in, embrace the loop. I'm not trans. I'm bi, and I'm ace, and that's enough labels for now. But I have a weird number of trans and non-binary friends. In the same way I surrounded myself with ADHD girlies for years before I realized, and potentially the same way I do with autistic folks, and... Uh. This keeps happening, huh? It's almost like a- Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative. I feel like my experiences in my body mirror trans women's more than trans men's, which makes no sense. I'm a cis woman. But I never felt validated in my gender when I dressed up like a tomboy as a child. But by that same token, I never felt like a girl, not in any way that mattered to me. 
But when I dye my hair and put on rainbow makeup and brightly colored outfits, regardless of gender presentation, that's when I feel most seen by people. When I'm doing an exaggerated version of myself. Looking back, it's always been this way. Everything is a perpetual present and a perpetual past. I'm eight years old and I dress up as Hercule Poirot for World Book Day, complete with mustache and fake belly. I've committed harder than anybody else in my grade. I think it's the first time I've dressed as a boy in public, but I'm not sure. It's the first time I remember. I'm 12 and I play Annie in the school musical and they dye my hair and it feels so much more like me than the blonde did. Looking in the mirror is easier this way. I don't know how to examine that yet. I'm 14 and Tim Roth's character in Lie to Me has become my alter ego when I'm stressed. Like if I channel him enough, I can get through whatever horrible situation I'm in. Slightly less the worse for wear. He only beat me once. The second time I let him win because I wanted to see how much he got off on uh, humiliating me. All right, there's a lot of people out there who might enjoy doing that, but they all know me. He doesn't. I don't know why he speaks to me more than the women in that show or any other. I'm 16 and playing Mr. Mushnick in Little Shop of Horrors and- Seymour. After the show, I overhear one of the other cast members refer to me and their mother says, that was a girl? And I feel this unbelievable burst of pride that I tricked at least one member of the audience. I'm 19 and dressing up as Poison Ivy to go clubbing on Halloween because this is the first time I've ever gotten to do that and I've always wanted to do something sexy for myself. I feel fabulous, powerful, and when people compliment me, I don't shy away as much because Poison Ivy would never. I'm 20 and I dress up as a Aziraphale for Comic-Con. I've never felt so comfortable in my own skin. I feel more myself when dressed up as other people than I ever have as myself. I dress as men, women, genderless angels, and I try not to examine why costumes are more comfortable than my clothes. I start to buy more colorful clothes to let them do the talking for me. I loved acting because breathing is easier when you're using someone else's lungs, even if that person's life is written the same as yours. Even if dressing as Stella makes you uncomfortable because the mirror is telling you you're one and the same. I start dyeing my hair. I grow it long, I chop it off, I buy new clothes, I try out so many things and I like myself in most of them, but only in hindsight. I look at photos of that past self and I recognize her, but I don't remember what it was like to walk in her shoes. I start taking care of my body again. I go on long walks, I eat healthy, I care about myself. Things are finally starting to look up. One of my closest friends, Lizette, tells me they think they might be non-binary and they explain their experience with gender and I'm supportive. I sum up their experience with the phrase, performing drag to project womanhood, and they agree that's exactly what it feels like. Internally, I question their decision because that's how I feel about gender and I'm not non-binary. Obviously. But what even is a woman? What is a woman? Shut the fuck up, nobody is asking you. Does feeling this way exclude you from being a woman or does it make you more of one? Does it matter? It does to me, I think. Sometimes. I'm 23 and I stopped taking care of my body. Chronic fatigue has kicked down the door of my temple and ransacked the place and I can't go on long walks anymore and cooking takes up so much energy and caring about myself is a waste of spoons. I still have to go to work. Gender isn't something I have time to deal with. Gender isn't something I have the time or energy to work through. I'm not trans. I don't think, at least not in the gender binary way. Of course, it would be easier to not be trans. Look at literally any news from the past few years and it's plain to see that. And as an AFAB person, it's easier for me to just present as a woman and not address it at all. Being a woman is hard, but being a trans person would be harder. I don't reject the label because I'm scared to be trans because I don't see transness as a bad thing. I reject it as a label because it doesn't fit externally. Internally, Time loops are my favorite kinds of- Can I call myself trans if my internal experience matches but my external experience doesn't factor in? Am I trans if I don't suffer like trans women or live through the trials of trans manhood? Do I need to present mask or androgynous just to be understood even if that doesn't align with my internal experience either? Trans women aren't all overly femme and trans men aren't all butch, but we all feel compelled to act towards those ends of the spectrum in case we're misunderstood or accused of lying. I hate TikTok face filters because the glamour ones make me look like a man in drag and not in the fun way. All the rest of you bitches out there using this filter and getting like conventionally attractive looks and I look like Charming from Shrek. Every time, every time one of these new bold glamour filters comes out, Charming from Shrek. Why would you do me like this? They updated the bold glamour filter and I still look like a man doing drag. Less so than last time, but that's not hard. <laughs> I don't mind it. It's like fun androgyny. And the male ones make me look like my father. 
I breathe a sigh of relief when I know I'm not trans because it means I will never have to look in the mirror and see any more of my father's face than I already do. I already see his face in every man I look at. It finds me even when I try desperately not to look for it, peeking out in the turn of a phrase, the raise of an eyebrow, the anger in strangers. I'm bisexual, but I can only fall in love with fictional men because real ones could be my father in disguise. He's so charismatic. He's so nice. He's so well liked in the community. He could never hit his children. I feel uncomfortable in my own skin. I have a complicated relationship with my weight. I wrote a poem about it. This is only some of it. I don't worry about my weight when I'm alone. I look in the mirror and I just see a person I sort of recognize. It doesn't matter if she's me or not, she's a person. And the way the fat spills over her hips doesn't bother me. I don't think about my flesh very often in public, but when I do, it's always negative, catching myself in a window and seeing the bulge over my jeans, staring at the fat I don't even notice when I'm not outside. The fat I live with comfortably every second of every day, right up until the moment I am perceived. I have Schrodinger's fat. It has to be seen to be believed. I feel prettiest with curls in my hair, but everybody I love tells me not to get a perm. I can't waste the hours or the spoons it would take to curl it every day, so I leave it for special occasions and mess with it in other ways so I'm not as bothered by it. I write a poem about shaving off my hair and then two years later I do it, in my garden, surrounded by queer joy behind COVID masks as my non-binary friends use the clippers to shave a mullet and ask if they should stop there because mullets are hot on women. Oh honey, I'm giving you a mullet. <laughs> honey. So <laughs> You just leave the mullet. Please leave the mullet. <laughs> leave the I mullet. Refuse. I don't want any hair on my neck. It I'll looks die. really punk rock. <laughs> I laugh, but I tell them to finish the job. I don't like the way I look with a shaved head, but not in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Just in the, this isn't the most flattering look on me way. I'm probably going to bleach mine this week and get it back to blonde again, because as it is, I look like I have... I've gone grey at 21. <laughs> I prefer it once it's grown out a little bit and styled, and I can mess with it. I mess with it a lot. I still haven't properly grown it back out. It's been three years. I might never do it, but it's a long life and I probably will. I'll never stop messing with it. This is actually the longest it's been in a hot minute. I do shave my legs and armpits, but not because I want to look more feminine, but because the feeling of hair against my clothes is a sensory nightmare and I'm not autistic. I find kinship in trans allegories in a way I don't notice until people point it out. I've always loved the work of the Wachowskis, I love werewolves and the Minotaur, I love stories about transformation, I'm obsessed with drag queens, Nimona makes you feel warm and fuzzy, and the trans subplot and secret crush on you makes me cry way more than it should if I were 100% cis. And very recently, Jordan Lee from Gen V is, um, everything to me. Whatever happened to her, Jordan? I watch K-dramas and stare dreamily at every man and woman on my screen because Korea does androgyny like nobody else and my bi ass is obsessed. That's the only reason. Oh my god, I've also just realized that I'm like, I was like obsessed with Mystique. She was like my favorite X-man. One of the characters in one of my novels is a shapeshifter who switches between genders. What? Oh girl. That's not- I, I have to pause my script. Oh, I'll be so fucking for real right now. <laughs> Fuck. Anyway, back to the script. I find K-pop and start collecting boy groups like Pokemons, only occasionally picking up girl groups I like, and I say it's because I don't like bubblegum pop, and it's true, but there's also something underneath it. I enjoy the music of the boy groups more, but I also enjoy their clothes, their makeup, their aesthetics more. Gender envy starts to become an undeniable factor with every new music video that drops. Han and Hyunjin in the Venom music video are almost entirely responsible for forcing me to confront this fact. You got me locked up, ay. It's time to remove you. Trap, trap, see my camel. Bean, take a nail. Hunt and I drop a chip while I sing a camel. I watch so many trans and non-binary creators not because of their transness, but because I love the content they make, and weirdly, those things just coincide a lot. I'm sure it's a coincidence. I fall in love with BLs, and at least a part of me can acknowledge that I connect with their stories more than GLs because of gender envy. Because those GLs don't feel like they're for me in the same way that BLs do. Those women don't look like me. They don't have my stories. Why don't I care as much about sapphic women as I do about- The future is too scary to contemplate. I'm not trans. I like my tits. I have this conversation dressed as a pinkified version of Columbia from Rocky Horror, surrounded by trans and non-binary friends who are talking about top surgery. By this point, I have changed my pronouns to she, they, because I don't mind either. We talk about it, about how I knew these people before they knew they were trans, about how they knew me before I knew I was ace, about how much we've grown and changed over the years. One of them is getting top surgery. One of them has been debating it for a while because they do have days where they don't mind their boobs. They ask me how I feel about mine, and I suddenly feel like an imposter in the conversation. I can't be trans, because I like my tits. I've never once wanted to be rid of them. I've never even wanted a binder. In fact, I actively enjoy getting them out for nobody's pleasure but my own, delighting in the way I can make them the focal point of an outfit with barely any effort at all. 
so I must be lying about my detachment from gender. A real non-binary person would want to chop their tits off. But one of them asks, do you think we'd feel the need to get surgery if society didn't place so much emphasis on those aspects of our body as female? And I breathe a sigh of relief because no, I don't think we would. I realize I've never thought of my boobs as something to make me more of a woman. I've never attached them to my womanhood at all. I don't feel affirmed in my gender when I wear push-up bras, I feel less back pain, and I look incredible. I've never worn makeup to look more like a woman, I wear makeup because I like rainbows, and I like to match my eyeshadow to my clothes. None of that was gender affirming. I didn't dress up as Columbia because she was a female presenting character, I dressed up as her because it meant I got to drastically change my appearance with stuff I mostly had at home. I would have been Frankenfurter, I just literally don't own the clothes. Next time, baby. Doing drag to perform femininity. Where have I heard that before? Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative. I talk about aceness and how it separates you from gender, about Canton Weiner's paper on asexuality and gender detachment. I plan to compare the experiences of asexual men, asexual women, and beyond the binary asexuals, but those categories didn't work. Why? About one third of respondents were uncomfortable being gendered. Based on this unexpected finding, I introduced the concept of gender detachment, which refers to feelings that gender identity slash expression is unimportant, pointless, and or oppressive. This raises the question, does everyone have a gender? My findings also lead me to consider gender as compulsory, helping us to better understand what it means for gender to be socially constructed, omnipresent, and regulatory. My AFAB trans and non-binary friends are fascinated because their experience with gender is so different. To them, everything that shackles them to womanhood is exactly that, a shackle. Something that was attached to them that they desperately want to be free of in order to exist comfortably. My experience with gender is like, a costume? I dress up like a girl because it's more fun. Boys don't get to wear makeup, not really, not yet. The version of myself that feels the most me has curly hair and rainbow glitter and a fun outfit on, regardless of what gender that makes people perceive me as. Nobody will ever look at me and assume I'm trans. Hell, even other queer people would hesitate to ask my pronouns because I often present so clearly female. I have no gender. People will decide for me anyway, and I don't mind, I don't think, but it does make me question how helpful labels can be if we have to constantly remind people who we are even after we've slapped them on. I don't think I have dysphoria. At least not gender dysphoria, not in the way that my trans friends have described it to me. But I do get self-dysphoria, if that makes sense. More than just dissociation, more than feeling detached, a profound sense of uneasiness in my existence. Not just in the body I'm in, but the brain that makes me the way I am. A misalignment. It's like my brain got taken out one day and put in backwards. The connections are all still there, but it doesn't run right. Like Capgrass Syndrome, where people wake up one day and think a body snatcher has taken their spouse and left an identical duplicate in their wake. Their spouse hasn't changed, but to the person suffering from it, it feels like they have, and it can be scary and disorientating to look at the person you love and feel like that person isn't looking back at you. I feel the same way about mirrors sometimes. My therapist tells me I need to heal my inner child. The version of me that no adults protected. The version of me that I still carry with me like a dead body that I can't help but walk the never-ending funeral procession for, hoping that if I don't put her in the ground, she might not actually be dead. Schrodinger's past self. Why are my best poems about suicide and misery? I make the same joke over and over again to hide that it isn't a joke. I'm only good at writing, singing, and making coffee, and making coffee is the only thing I can be objective about. It's never been a joke. But I say it like one, because I learned a long time ago that in order for people to hear something true, you have to say it while smiling or they won't want to listen anymore. <sighs> my head hurts. My head always hurts nowadays. So do my arms, my shoulders, my hands, at the moment my hips. But I keep writing and singing because those are the parts of me that make the most sense. I only feel tethered to a sense of self when I'm pretending to be somebody else. I keep trying to write a poem about direction illusion, but I can't make it work. That disagreement between your perception of where you're going and where you're actually going. The feeling of walking through a tree-studded woods and losing all sense of direction because the whole world on every side feels the same, and it's far too easy to get hopelessly lost. I'm a good writer. I am a good writer. I am a good writer. I have to be. Because if that's not true, then I have nothing else. There is no me. There's just a coffin around an abused child, and nobody wants to hear about that. Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative, maybe because I feel closest to them, because my brain always plays memories on loop, hoping against all that is logical that if I can just somehow fix those moments, get them right, I would be free from them. I don't think I'm autistic. I don't think I'm trans. I think I'm... I think I'm non-binary, or genderqueer, or agender. I think I have ADHD. I have depression. I have anxiety. I have CPTSD. I was raised in an emotionally abusive household. 
I'm lonely. I'm touch starved. I'm a writer. I want to be seen for who I am. I don't want to be perceived. I don't think I'm... There are two different halves of the thing that come together to make up your identity, right? The internal and the external. The internal perception of yourself and the external perception of you and those two things together make up the secret third thing that is your identity. So if other people externally perceive me in the behaviors that I exhibit as autistic, but I, as an internal experience, do not label them as autistic, what's the truth? And why does it matter? Why do I care if you think I'm autistic? Why do I care if I'm autistic? Because if society gets it right, I'll feel more seen? Do I need people to use the right labels because I had the wrong ones for so long? Do I reject labels that don't feel right because they're actually wrong for me? Or because I'm scared they're not? If I cannot perceive myself correctly and other people cannot perceive me correctly, do I just cease to exist? No. Like time, in perceiving, you create it and that makes a whole host of new problems. Your identity is devastatingly relative but it's also eternal and happening all at once. I will always be that little girl who wasn't protected enough. I will always be the version of me that didn't know I was ace, who wanted more than anything to not be a virgin anymore because it felt like something to cross off the list of important milestones. I will always be lonely, but I will always want to be loved. Sometimes your identity isn't something you decide. Sometimes it happens at you. You don't have a choice. All you can do is perceive it. People call me a girl and I don't mind, but it doesn't feel quite right. I joke about daddy issues because it must be hard to be friends with somebody who is always dealing with some kind of trauma. I don't make eye contact with people properly, but it's not autism, it's just... Then put your little hands in mine, there ain't no hill or mountain we can climb. I got you, babe. I got you. Time loops are my favorite kinds of narrative, maybe because I feel closest to them, because my brain always plays memories on the loop, hoping against all that is logical, but I can just somehow fix them right, get them right. I would be free from them. Everything is a perpetual present Everything is a perpetual present and a perpetual past. Oh. Hello. It's strange, I feel like even though I've been stuck in this loop, I've learned a lot about myself. I feel like I'm leaving the loop as a new person. The loops were frustrating and painful, and sometimes they're made up of pointless suffering, but I made my way through. This won't be the last time I leave a loop. Life is cyclical and time is relative. There's a reason why time loops are my favourite kinds of... I accidentally took a month off. Whoops! I, as I said in my previous video, there was a lot of factors that came into that, and part of that was that, like, the world is on fire, and my brain is on fire, and those two things in combination uh, made it really hard to make stuff. I was still writing. I was still, I was still doing the creative part. I was still, in fact, I was probably writing more than I have in in months. I was, I've, I've got like five or six half written video essays now, like in a backlog, that I can start working on. It was just the sitting down and the making, because especially something like this, this art is so personal. It means something to me, and so. I think like making it is one thing, like writing it is one thing, but 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 creating it to be seen is an entirely different thing. Knowing that this is a piece of myself that I'm putting out there is an entirely different thing because people can see it and tear it apart and do whatever they like with it. Once you post a piece of art, it doesn't wholly belong to just you anymore. Ed Sheeran, I think, said this at one point in an interview when he was asked about what his favorite song of his was and he was like, it's one you haven't heard. Because the moment that he releases an album, they're not his favourites anymore, they're not his anymore, they belong to the public. I feel that way a lot about my my art, my essays, my poetry. Like, once my essays are out, i got to let them go. i got to just understand that people will perceive them in any way they'd like to, and sometimes that means they perceive me in any way they'd like to, and that's the hardest part of being a person, is, like, realising the way you perceive yourself and the way that other people perceive you can be completely different. That's one of the, the things that you learn from being abused, is your abuser doesn't love you. They can't. If you love someone, you can't systematically abuse them like that. They don't love you. They love the version of you that they have created in their head that they can subjugate and step on. And then the moment that you decide you don't want to be stepped on anymore, you're a problem and that's an issue. And you're not the person that I married. You're not the person that I raised. You're not the person that I'm friends with. It's that issue of perception that is always the problem. And I think a lot about perception. So much of my art is about perception and being perceived and 
telling stories and how we project ourselves out to people and about the things we're haunted by and like so many of the stories that I write are about that and the poems I write and the essays I write often ruminate on this exact thing on how we perceive people how we try to be perceived by others and it's complicated and there isn't an answer but I'm fascinated by it and I could write 800 more videos on it it's it's a hard one because it's like as i said in the video like why do why do i care if other people think i'm autistic why do i care if other people don't think i'm trans why do i care and it's because we're humans we want to connect with people we, we want people to understand us truly we do like even even when we're trying to be as mysterious and cloaked in enigma as possible we still deep in our hearts want to be understood by somebody somewhere somehow so much of the things i consume on youtube are youtubers making essays about identity and politics and how those things intersect and how humanity intersects with the version of humanity that we've created to be society. CJ the X videos, FD Signifier videos, Leftist Cooks videos, Jesse Gender, Philosophy Tube, H Bomber Guy. And I watch my fair share of like funny, silly commentary YouTubers as well, do not get me wrong. But the stuff that always like punches a hole right through my chest, it's always like, oh, I'll just watch this like casual Leftist Cooks video about harm and justice and like, you know, restorative uh, practices. And, and this will be like a, a cool <laughs> couple of hours to pass my time with. And then there's a section in the middle about forgiveness. And I just break down in tears and realize that that's some stuff that I'm going to need to work through probably in an essay of my own in responding to that section because I'm like oh and that's what being art is and like I've just finished like literally before I filmed this I finished watching H Bomber Guy's video about plagiarism it makes me think about like the debate between AI and art and plagiarism and art and plagiarists not understanding that just taking stuff and without attributing it to anybody is disrespectful. An AI artist not understanding that the AI tool, which is not AI, it's machine learning, the machine learning tool is scrubbing through existing art. And their argument for that is always, oh, but like that's other artists do it as well. Other artists copy other art all the time. And it's like, yeah, but when a human does it, we're evolving through it. Like when I watch those video essays, they make me better at making video essays. That's why I reference CJ the X in this video. That video, while I was writing this, I watched that Stranger Things video, which I had been putting off for months. And I, d I didn't know why, because I'd started it and I'd watched the first 10 minutes. And I think I just went, oh no, this is going to be, this is going to hit me too hard and I have to stop. And I put it down. And then for some reason, while I was writing this, I was like, I think this video could help me. And I don't know why I thought that, but I... It did. I was right. Touched a part of me. It punched a hole right through my chest and became the missing piece in what I was talking about. I was trying to figure out why I was trying to draw a line between time loops and my brain. And the way that they talked about trauma trapping you in time suddenly made it all click for me. And like, they didn't invent that idea, but that was where I heard it. So that's where I create, that's where I credited them. Because art is communal. It's collaborative it's creative it's societal no artist has ever existed in a vacuum no artist ever comes out and goes this is my piece of art there are no influences on this at all i came out of the womb with my eyes ears and mouth shut i didn't interact with anything and i've painted this thing it would be weird and impressive if they did sick as hell but every piece of art has an influence on it every and every part of you as a person has an influence on it the way i speak the way i intonate the slang that i use the accents that i constantly cycle through i've moved around so much like my family's northern i live in essex i lived in australia so my accent will switch between those things mid-sentence i get so many comments from people being like oh are you american because i say things like ask and class and mask which if you're American and you assume that all British people say ask and mask and class, you assume that in order to be doing that, it's because I'm American or I lived in America or something happened. Nope, it's just Northern. <laughs> it's just Northern. And there are loads of parts of the UK that are very like that. And I think you can tell I'm Northern in some of some of the other words, like, like, like some. I say some. I don't say some. I say some. Some of the words. Much. Things like that. Like I, that I, I don't notice in the moment, but that people will point out after the fact. They'll comment. And I'll, I'll switch them up. Sometimes I'll say class and i won't notice i'm doing it because i am just an amalgamations of the places i've been to the accents i've heard the people i've been around humans are collaborative projects <laughs> which is why isolation is so bad for me which is why i've been so broken for the last like three years i love isolating myself and in a lot of ways it is very helpful and i think in a lot of ways it can be very therapeutic to isolate yourself up to a point but when that isolation is forced and when the world is cr crashing around you while you're isolating it's not it's not good it's not good and healthy for you and it's um it's hard to deal with. None of these uh, YouTubers need uh, need advertising from me, but I've linked them all in the description anyway because I love them. I don't have the budget to make videos the way that they are, but one day, 
one fucking day. At the moment, I'm having lots of audio problems, um, so we'll see how that goes. I'm always trying to have more to say, to to improve on my art and my craft and my voice. And it's important to me that I get to make videos like this, even if only a thousand of my subscribers watch it, which would be a little bit upsetting. <laughs> YouTube has re been really screwing me lately. I have 16,000 subscribers and it seems like it's not showing any of them my new uploads, <laughs> which is um, disheartening. But even if only a thousand people see it, even if only five people see it, even if only one person sees it, if that one person is affected by it, feels seen by it, feels understood, feels heard, that's all I care about. That's all my art has ever been about. It's been about trying to feel understood by others, trying to understand other people. As a lonely, neurodivergent, insecure, queer kid in an abusive household, I was just, my whole life is just reaching out silently, invisibly, reaching out to other people, begging. <laughs> begging to be seen, begging to be helped. It's just important to me that my channel is a refuge like that for people, I think. And like, I make I make slightly antagonistic content sometimes. I talk about the things that, that piss me off, about the way we talk about people and about the, the way we critique art. And like, sometimes critiquing art is 100% justified. And sometimes the way we do it isn't. And it's just very important to me that we're always evolving how we view art criticism and art in general. Humanity can't grow if we don't let art evolve. Evolution is predicated on creativity. Like, science will not exist without creativity. You could be the most analytical person on the planet, but if you don't have the creativity to come up with new ideas, what are you analyzing? The same thing over and over and over again? You need a spark of creativity to think of something new. We can't evolve unless we constantly re-examine old ideas, start examining new ideas, come up with new stuff. That's why I like time loops. You can be stuck in the same loop every day, but then you'll notice a person you've never noticed before. You'll do a different thing. And this novel that I'm writing is basically about 12 different people going through time loops. So if you would like to help me get that novel published, if you'd like to read that novel, um, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I'm sorry. Please consider... I, I hate plugging myself at the end of, like, deeply emotional artistic videos, but, like, it has to be done because, unfortunately, we do live under capitalism and I do need to be paid in order to keep making these videos the way I would like to, or even better, or with more of a budget, or to get my novel published. I have numerous novels in the works, but the Time Loop one is the one I've been working on the most recently. And it's something I'm very proud of. It's something I care about a lot and it means a lot to me. And so I would like to get it published. But in order to get it published, I would like to have a stable platform that I would be able to show it on because a lot of publishers now literally just don't don't want to take people on unless they're willing to do their own social media shilling which is insane because previously that was the publisher's job but that's just how it is now in the advent of like TikTok advertising so if I had a stable YouTube channel with a stable number of views that I could be like this number of people tune into me when I post things this is the number of people, the percentage of those people who would consider buying my novel. It would be a big help. So if you would like to read my novels, if you would like to watch more of my videos, if you would like to watch exclusive content that does not get posted to this channel, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. Uh, if you are if you are subscribing and you do want to watch my videos as they come out, please remember to ring the bell because YouTube just won't show it to you otherwise. Please comment with your own experiences with gender, with mental health, with whatever else, because I love reading through them. It always makes me happy to know that people are engaging earnestly with my art and... Um, and like like Patrick H. Willem says, like the word content just feels icky, and I don't I don't like using it, so I'd rather not. Um, it doesn't my my videos like this, this they're not content to me. They are art, they are essays, they are writing, they are personal. I did consider doing this entirely audio only because I just couldn't make myself film stuff, but I was like, I could record audio. Um, and I even recorded an audio track just for that. I realized in the end that like, I don't think this video is quite suited to audio only. I think, especially the gender stuff, you really need the visual of a person sitting here with their tits out and some makeup on to get the point. <laughs> I'm not a woman, but God, don't I look good when I'm dressed as one? I hope you're all doing well in these like really stressful hard times. Um, I hope you're all taking care of yourselves. I've been, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. I'm working on it. The psych video, like I said, the script is done. I just need to find a day to film. So that'll, after this one goes up, it'll probably be another couple of weeks and then that one will go up. Obviously like I have to film it, but then I also have to edit it and I have to make sure I don't get struck for copyright immediately using so many clips of one show so i will be i'll be taking a lot of care with that one in the meantime there will be patreon videos going up there should be one going up right after this um just a short one very um little droll style going up my patreon after this just just to thank my patreons for being so patient with me while i haven't been getting them enough content um in the last month i have a lot more on the way that I'm really excited to get to show you. Thank you. Earnestly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for tuning in over this last year, for being able, for watching enough of my con uh, oh, content, for watching enough of my videos that I'm able to 
make money off of them and I might be able to pursue it as a career. I can't yet, but the fact that enough of you are tuned in to even, even earn me like a little bit of money that I can use to pay car bills and stuff has been so, so meaningful to me. I cannot thank you enough. It means so much. And I'm hoping to be able to do even more projects next year. I'm hoping to be able to collab with some of the YouTubers that I love so very much. Um, so if any other YouTubers see this that are also into this kind of stuff, hit me up. Hit me up. DM me. I love you. I love you a lot. I love you so much. And I don't have a lot of the tech that would allow me to collaborate very well with other people, but I will come to you. I will drive. If I have to drive to fucking Ireland, I'll fucking do it left as cooks. <laughs> remember to stop and take a breath every now and then and remember that like, if you can't constantly focus on the news, if it, it is ruining your mental health like it did mine the last month, you are allowed to step away and just take a breath and not look for, for a little while. Because if it's stopping you from functioning for yourself, as, as people kept reminding me in the comments of that video, on an airplane you're supposed to... Airplane? What century am I from? On a plane, you're supposed to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you try and put it on somebody else. Because if you're too busy trying to put it on somebody else, you might screw that up because you're losing oxygen on your own and then you're both without oxygen and then you're screwed. It's okay if I need to put the oxygen mask on myself first before I'm able to help anyone else. Be kind to yourselves, be kind to others, and hopefully there will not be as long of a wait <laughs> between this video and the next one, which should finally be the psych one. I'm off to go and work on my time loop novel again and again and again and again and again. And again.